I love visual novels. The art design, audio direction, the narrative structures that could be employed, all coming together to create a unique storytelling experience that can really immerse the player in that story's world. Now for me, some personal favorites include Danganronpa, Steins Gate, and my number one personal favorite, Clannad. Yeah, bet you didn't expect that one. But seriously, Clannad is one heck of an emotional ride. Gave me melancholy, 10 out of 10, would do it again. Now, if I haven't already made it clear on my channel before, I'm a huge sucker for games that try to incorporate concepts in the field of psychology and neuroscience into their narrative. Monarch, my game of 2021, was a good example of how you can play with pop psychology as a game mechanic. Despite its lack of real life science, I can enjoy the attempt, you know? So, when a game comes around that really pushes a more grounded approach to the social sciences, I do take notice. And one such game that caught my eye was AI Somnium Files, a wonderfully unique narrative experience that deals on the deep end of crime, psychology, and neuroscience. The game was released back in 2019, and from at least my memory, didn't really get too much fanfare. Regardless of this game's success or not, it has warranted a sequel, which is coming out in a few days. So, in celebration of the upcoming release of its sequel, The Nirvana Initiative, I thought it would be good to revisit the original and talk a bit about the game, its story, and most importantly, for the sake of better using my psychology and neuroscience degrees for once, to talk about the game's science and how it's portrayed. Therefore, to get a better idea of the science, I'll need to get everyone on the same page about the story. So, this video will be divided into two parts. A summary of the roots with timestamps for each section, and then a summary thoughts section afterwards where I express my thoughts on the science and much more. So, please refer to the timestamps in the description as needed. Trust me, we're going in on the deep end here with this one. The overall experience with this game can take between 20 to 30 hours and branches into five routes, like many of Spike Chunsoft's other projects, specifically 999, which comes to mind. You'll be required to play through multiple routes to gather pieces of the story that will, in turn, play a direct narrative role later. Each route also has an associated color and character, for ease of understanding, which is displayed on a corkboard a la detective film. So let's get into the story itself. I'll be covering all routes in a succinct but spoilerish way. The events of the game effectively occur over the scope of five to six days, which is contingent on the route that you go down, and they will have us explore a series of murders and mysteries that the game presents early on. So there's a lot to cover, and I'll try to be as concise as I can be without losing too much information. Also, this game can get a bit on the graphic side, and nothing too crazy in my opinion, but if you're squeamish, just, uh, Eh, look away a bit, so be warned about that. Anyway, spoilers incoming in 3, 2, 1. The story opens with a murder in an abandoned theme park. We are introduced to our lead character, Kaname Date, a special detective for the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. Date has been set here to investigate the murder, as the victim is one Shoko Nadame, an old friend of his. Joining Date is his boss, Boss, and his AI companion Aiba, which is directly connected to Date's brain via what could be best described as a robotic eyeball. Upon investigating this grisly murder, there's one thing that sticks out. The victim's left eye was removed. This puzzles Date and the team as they work to uncover clues at the scene. Relying on Aiba, who has the ability to perform infrared and x-ray scans with her eyeball, we discover a young girl hiding inside the carousel near the corpse. She is Mizuki, the victim's daughter, and just so happens to be under Date's care. Shortly after, we're taken to the hospital to watch over Mizuki. While there, we rest and begin to speak with Aiba, in our brain, where we are introduced into the Somnium, or the dream world of sorts. This is where the main crux of gameplay exists. The Somnium is described to us as a dreamlike subconscious that we can interact with in order to adjust the psyche of an individual. The objective of these dives is to break mental locks that have uh, a multitude of effects on various people. For instance, we can support those who are psychologically scarred to recover quicker, or we can force view fragments of memories. Though it is important to note that the game constantly states that what we see are not direct memories. 
but dreams that utilize memory data and experiences. Nonetheless, this information can be very helpful in trying to understand the truth. So I'd like to take a moment to quickly discuss the gameplay of AI Somnium files, as by now you've already experienced the two main sides, the investigations and the Somnium. The investigations play just like typical point and click visual novels. You have a cursor and are able to interact with almost everything that you see, which prompts some form of response from Date, Aiba, or any characters in the surrounding environment. Additionally, there are times we have access to Aiba's special functions, such as X-ray vision or infrared vision, which helps with the investigation or provides some additional extra background information. In regards to the Somnium, the game changes into a third person puzzler of sorts. You'll be in control of Aiba most of the time, and you'll need to navigate a 3D puzzle by interacting with objects in the Somnium to change the composition of the room. Depending on the Somnium and its puzzle, you may have different ways to solve it, which leads to the various root splits you need to experience. To add some challenge, the game relies on a narrative device of where you can only spend six minutes in a Somnium. Remember this, it will be very, very important later. Standing still has the timer go down slowly. However, moving will greatly increase this countdown. Furthermore, each object you interact with has a cost of sorts. So when you interact with any of these puzzles, you'll further lower that timer. To help with this, timies are introduced in the second Somnium, and these allow you to adjust and lower the time of an interaction's cost. Unfortunately, there are positive and negative timies, and in a good amount of cases, these are randomized. So you may sometimes get too many negative timies, which will increase the cost and time of actions, which will have you fail an investigation. Do you note, know, however, that you can retry up to three times based on which mental lock you've already opened. And honestly, don't worry too much about this, as in many cases, positive timings tend to be a bit more common than the negative ones. Now, back to the plot. So after we get some strange foreshadowing in Dante Somnium, we get a nice expositional lore dump of what's going on. Basically, we work for the Advanced Brain Investigation Squad, ABIS, pronounced Abyss, whose job it is to conduct criminal investigations by understanding and penetrating the human mind. That's the official quote, by the way. Naturally, this is a very secretive organization within the Tokyo Police Department, so it's sort of a black ops kind of deal, I suppose. To accomplish their mission and goal, one of their members, Pewter, an engineer, helps to maintain and develop the photosynaptic neurocoupling device, or sync machine. This is a contraption that allows for a sinker, such as Date, to dive into the somnium of another person. We also learn a bit about Date as well. We find out that he lost his memory six years ago, around the time he lost his right eye. We find out that he's been working with Abyss for around the same amount of time, and that Aiba and him have been together for around five years now. We also learn a little bit about the incident of six years ago that he was involved with, where something had happened and that made something else happen, and yeah, honestly, the details are deliberately scarce here, but don't you worry, we'll get there. Anyway, we go out to find leads and meet all the main players. Aset, or Iris, a young net idol. Ota, a huge otaku fan of Aset. Mizuki, our roommate. So Seijima, a congressman. Hitomi, Iris' mother, who suffers from a disabling arm injury. And finally, Mayumi, Ota's mother, who's a bit strange for now. A bit after that, we learn that Mizuki is up and about, but is suffering from mutism. To find out her account of the events and what happened on the night of Shoko's death, we dive into her mind using the sync machine and attempt to free Mizuki from her psychosomatic condition. So now is where we start getting the root splits, and I'll try to run through each one in a succinct manner. But once again, just as a final warning, major spoilers are coming in for all roots, so please feel free to jump ahead if you don't want to be spoiled on a specific route. Otherwise, let's sink in. The first route you'll likely cover is Ota's route, or the red route, and this is arguably the longest route in the game. This route heavily explores the relationship between Ota, Mizuki, and Iris. During this route, Mizuki explains her account of the murder, and we learn that her father, Renju, and her mother, Shoko, are divorced, and basically living their own lives. Hence why Mizuki lives with Date. 
Mizuki also informs us that her father had sent her a message on the night of the murder, asking for her to meet him at the crime scene. This leads us to hunt down Renju, but we sadly find him murdered, missing his left eye as well. This leads us on a wild goose chase as we meet with Yakuza that are affiliated with Renju and Shoko, and we eventually question Iris as a suspect, which leads Ota to white knighting her so hard that we take a pan to the head. Eventually, the killer finds their way to Iris, and Ota is forced to defend her, which he does successfully, leading everyone to think, who's the dude in the polar bear suit? The final investigations have us looking at Ota and Mayumi as the criminals. However, we ultimately uncover that neither of them are the culprit, and in fact, Mayumi suffers from severe dementia. We are told of their family story and how much Ota is such an ungrateful puppy. By the end, Ota decides to make better choices to help support his mother, and sort of becomes Iris' boyfriend. Go, mate! And unfortunately, in the grand scheme, we don't get much in terms of whodunit, or the true nature of the events in AI Somnium Files. <music> Mizuki's route is a short split off towards the end of Ota's route. Once we learn about Ota's events with the killer, Date pushes himself a bit too hard in the Somnium and goes into a coma. This prompts Mizuki to step up and enter Dante's Somnium to free his mind and to bring him back. Needless to say, this ends very well, as Mizuki begins to truly understand how much Date really cares for her like a daughter. Date wakes up from his coma, and Mizuki and Date live happily ever after as father and daughter. A fitting, happy end about family. Yet again, though no new progress is made on the case, and all this ending is more or less just to flesh out Mizuki and Date's relationship a little bit more. Iris's route is effectively close to the same length as Ota's, but definitely goes with a different theme. For this route, rather than supporting and caring for Mizuki and her Somnium, we fail and instead uncover an image of a corpse that looks extremely close to Iris. This takes us down a path where Iris becomes best girl. We do more sleuthing, and this time events play out much differently. Renju, Mizuki's father, has disappeared and does not get killed. We also get a lot more face time with So Sujima, the congressman, who leads us to a warehouse that happens to house the frozen corpse of a woman that appears identical to Iris. After an intense moment, we sync with so Sejima, and we confirm that he, at least in the Somnium, has killed Iris. However, after some mysterious calls from the police stating that the body cannot be found, we quickly learn that Iris is in fact alive and well with Mizuki at her house. This led Date to believe that acts in the Somnium could impact real life, which is naturally dismissed by Aiba as complete rubbish. However, as we continue down this track, we learn the shocking and completely insane truth, as Iris informs us that a secret society called Nizalox, 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 I think, Nice. you know what, let's just go on, is out to kill her. Basically, the Wajit system, which is an extremely advanced AI system and is an integral part of Aiba and the Sync Machine, is actually some kind of alien radio signal that was discovered and used by humans to create the Wajit system. And using the Wajit system, we are able to make an artificial satellite called X00639, which is a radio transmitter. The purpose of Nizalox, just what's on the screen right now, is to basically propagate the Wajit system across the universe for reasons. Seriously, she doesn't really say why, but she does talk a bit about power and that kind of jazz. I mean, she also makes consistent references to alternative timelines and parallel universes that we may exist in. Anyway, we believe her, because best girl, and continue down this path where we aim to protect her from armed assassins, traitors in abyss, and eventually she gets captured and taken to a factory by Renju that actually houses another sink machine. She collapses, for some reason, and we have to try and dive in to rescue her because remember, what we accomplish in the Somnium impacts the real world. Sadly, while we are very successful in her Somnium and we save her, she still dies in real life, and that's it. End of Iris's route. Just a quick note here, it's more than likely you'll start on the Peach route, otherwise known as the true ending, before you get into the destruction route. However, to complete that true ending, you must first finish this route. 
In fact, the game will actually cut you off and prevent you from experiencing the latter half of the true ending if you don't do this first. So let's just bang this out now, and then we'll go after the true ending at the end. This route, known as the Destruction Route, is a split off of Ota's route about midway through. In this case, when we sync with Iris, we learn that she has memories of the deaths of the four victims from the incident six years ago. This incident, which really only starts mattering now during this route, is called the original Cyclops Killer incident, and is named so as all the victims had their right eye removed. With these crimes very similar to what we've seen in this game with Ota's route and so forth, except with just the left eye being removed, this has prompted the new killings to be known as the new Cyclops Killer incident. So once again, six years ago, original Cyclops. What's happening right now, new Cyclops. With that said, this route has us learn about the events of six years ago and how things are connecting to each other now. So, events play out very similar to Ota's route, except this time when Iris and Ota get caught up in that polar bear ice factory jazz that they go on, they both get killed. Like, for realsies, they are dead. This props Dante to get his jazz together and to really learn the truth, which takes us to an inmate referred to as number 89, who is actually an assassin named Falco. Falco. No, I'm not going to make the joke. We meet him in Iris's route, but he really doesn't play a huge role at the time. So Falco informs us of his story. He used to be a detective, but got discouraged when nothing was really changing in the world. So he decided to start killing criminals. The police were covering up his wrongdoings, and with anyone that really put him in check, he just kept going. Eventually, he started working with the Yakuza, but then he met Hitomi and Iris, and decided he wanted out of the game. But the Yakuza boss, Rohan, had other plans for him. Naturally, we're getting to the good part now, but number 89 doesn't really want to play anymore. So we sync with him and learn that Hitomi's arm injury occurred when Rohan shot her. During this time in this event, the boss, our boss, Date's boss, was also there. So what's going on? In an attempt to investigate the boss in her office, we check her PC and we find a video of her murdering So Sejima. Obviously, we chase her down to find out what's going on. We outwit her with some funniest shenanigans and we sink to finally learn the truth or at least a huge part of it. Every character we've met thus far, Renju, Iris, So, the boss. They are all the new Cyclops killers. So Sojima's son, named Saito, who we learn very, very early in the game is living overseas, is basically brain jacking everyone using the prototype sync machine that we found in the factory during Iris's route. We also learn that Date is not actually Date. Date is someone who happens to be using the body of Saito, and Saito really, really, really wants his body back. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but remember during the gameplay segment, I talked about the six minutes in the Somnium? Well, the game makes a big stick out of it, like always saying, you remember, you have six minutes. Well, the reason is simple. After six minutes, the consciousness of the individuals start blending together. The game up until now states that you'll eventually rewrite someone's conscious by doing this, when in fact you actually swap consciousness. So you basically body swap after six minutes. So if you're in a if you're in the somnium longer than six minutes, you can actually possess that individual's body. And this is what happened to Saito and Date. Date, for some reason, took Saito's body and he wants it back. He pops some explosives on Hitomi for leverage. And then you, Date, are forced to swap your body for the boss's body. Saito gets his body back. Boom! Hitomi dies. Saito tries to run, but Aiba, who is, again, still lodged in his head, KOs him via electric shock. Basically, you lose consciousness as everyone you cared for is dead. But Iris's words of parallel worlds echo in your head, fade to black. All right, so most of the pieces are in place. Let's finish this up. During Iris's route in our second sync with her, we have the choice to not believe her story. You know, the one with the secret society. If we follow this train of thought, we are able to push towards the truth and it is revealed by the true best girl, Hitomi, that Iris has a malignant brain tumor. This tumor is giving her delirium and hence the strange paranoia and the stories with all this nonsense involving secret societies. We also learned that she would need an experimental nanomachine treatment to have a chance of living past the new year, 
However, the cost of such a treatment is extremely high, so what could be done? Well, after some consideration, Date, with Iba's help, connects the dots. Hitomi and Renju are revealed early on to have a past from way, way back in high school. It's also revealed that they had a mutual friend named Monica who passed away. Perhaps this body was not Iris's, but Monica's. We sync with Hitomi, and we finally get the picture. In fact, once we know, she's actually very forthcoming with the truth. Monica was So Sejima's mistress who got pregnant with Iris. She wanted to keep the baby and ultimately had Iris in secret, but didn't inform So about this. With that said though, she did want to let So know about the situation, so Monica visited him. So offered buckets of money for her to go overseas in an attempt to save his political career, but honestly, she didn't really care much. In fact, it seems like they kind of just talked about it and they mutually, amicably ended the relationship. But then, as she was walking away, Saito rushed out of hiding and killed Monica. This was obviously very shocking for So, but he needed to protect his family. So, using his mafia connections, he contacted Roham and disposed of the evidence. Hitomi had known about this, and in an attempt to protect Iris, as arguably Rohan would go after Iris as well, decided to raise Iris as her own. Then, once Hitomi and Iris learned about the cancer that was happening and the treatment costs, Hitomi decided to blackmail Sosajima into getting the money she needed for the surgery, hence where we are now. But it gets even more crazy. Iris eventually gets taken and Hitomi and Date go to get her. Then we learn the absolute final pieces of the puzzle. You see, it's revealed now that Saito has a congenital brain defect that makes it so he cannot properly secrete oxytocin, a hormone that deals a lot with empathy, but I'll get into that soon. Essentially, Saito doesn't feel pleasure or love from anything except murder. He partners up with Rohan, who happens to have brain lesions from injuries sustained in his youth, and they together formed the original Cyclops Killers. This brings us to number 89, whose real name is Hayato Yagyu, the detective turned assassin. Once he met Hitomi and wanted out, Rohan had placed a hit on Hitomi and Iris, knowing that it would lock Hayato in place and keeping him around the gang. Hayato then contacted the boss, which was an old friend of his, for some help. The boss proposed a plan. Use the sink machine to swap bodies with Rohan, give the order to make Iris and Hitomi untouchable, making them safe, Unfortunately, though, this would mean that Hayato would never be able to see them again, as he'd be possessing Rohan's body and leading the Yakuza, but honestly, probably a small price to pay to protect the people who he wants to protect, his loved ones. The plan, then, mostly went off without a hitch, but Rohan, now in Hayato's body, tried to finish the job. The real Hayato in Rohan's body and boss stopped the assassination on Hitomi. However, in this process, Hayato, again possessing Rohan's body, accidentally shoots Hitomi, hence the arm injury I mentioned at the start of the game, at the start of this video, and sorry, the game that's mentioned. Sometime later, Rohan is detained and becomes number 89. Hayato decides then to help the boss with the original Cyclops killings because again, he's basically Rohan and decides to visit Saito. Saito, realizing that this is a setup, basically gets Hayato made and Hayato using a truth serum reveals that the sink machine exists. So, Saito nabs it and swaps consciousness with Hayato, but the process kind of sort of fails and he loses his memories. After the swap, Hayato, who is now in Saito's body, basically runs away, losing his memories. He gets picked up by the boss and becomes Kaname Date. In the meantime, Saito just kind of bides his time and swaps from person to person in an attempt to get his original body back. Now, I do apologize if that was very confusing, but honestly, at the end of this game, literally, people are mind jacking each other like nuts. So once again, it's Hayato, the basically original Date, who's the assassin, goes into Rohan, who is the Yakuza boss, who then goes into Saito. And this happens because basically he gets made when he visits Saito, because Saito realizes that that's not the real Rohan. And then Saito, just I guess in his delusion or fantasy or whatever, wants to trap the machine and ends up swapping his body by accident. So there you go. Anyway, just to wrap this all up, we get our old body back, we kill Saito, and we live happily ever after. Whew, 
now that took a lot longer than expected. <laughs> well, I guess I'll suppose we get into my thoughts now, and I'll try to be extremely succinct here. I really enjoyed the game's presentation. The VOs in both Japanese and English are absolutely amazing, especially with Mizuki's English voice actor. The overall visuals, while sometimes a bit iffy on the Switch, is really good. I have a certain affinity for Spike's animation style. And the gameplay elements work out really well. I can't complain as many of the Somniums feel just right for the difficulty when they're placed in the game, and the investigations tend to be very straightforward, but do necessitate some thinking in order to progress into the next scene. With that said, I do have a few issues with the game. First, while the story is fun, interesting, and keeps a solid pace, it is fairly predictable, especially after you clear out your first route or two. Much of what I was already considering as the twists could be picked out early on, especially if you know a thing or two about psychology and neuroscience. Furthermore, some of the presentations of the plots were just a bit too out there. For instance, Iris's main route was my least favorite. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy some really good conspiracy theories and mysticism. I was especially keen on that part, as I recall 999 having a lot of elements about parallel universes, psychic secret organizations, so I got a bit excited thinking that AI might be set in a similar universe, but nope, all of that is pretty much dropped. Furthermore, the parallel universes concept that does kind of persist doesn't really sit right with me. It's brought up in Iris's root, just the destruction route and the true roots, but it, it gets no extra expansion or explanation. It's just referenced a few times like, how do I know this? Or how do you think you know that? And then we just hear Iris's voice like, it's a parallel world. I mean, I would have personally enjoyed some adjustments to Iris's route that goes a little bit more into the parallel universe phenomenon and less with the secret society crap. Honestly speaking, I really wish they would have put this out more because yeah it just it, it's there but it's not and then that actually brings me to Saito he's mentioned one time at the start and he doesn't get mentioned at all again until the destruction or the true roots so it's just sort of like he pops out of nowhere you know deus ex plot line no real foreshadowing and it seems like it was an afterthought which got me thinking between Saito's inclusion and this parallel universes thing, was this kind of the real story that they wanted to tell? So I brought this to some of my colleagues and friends uh, who played this game and had their experiences as well, and most of them had the same response. It was a fun adventure, but just feels really tame. And I have to agree with this. It almost feels like they were going, or I should say they were originally going for a very wild alien sci-fi neuroscience tale. And they basically wrote three fifths of the roots. And then some producer was probably like, hey guys, maybe we should, you know, tone it down. We want to sell this in the West, right? So let's, uh, let's keep it more simple, right? Which not to say Westerners can't handle a crazy sci-fi story. Again, see Don Con Rampa for that reference. But compared to the extremes that Spike Chonsoff went for for their past IPs, there just feels like a lot of limitations on this one. Again, this is just my opinion, so take it at face value. AI Somnia Files goes out of its way with attempting to explain things in a grounded reality. The game constantly makes comments on how Date's cortisol levels are increasing, or how Iba needs to boost the ACTH of Date to respond quicker in battle, and so on. I don't really have much to pick on here. It's all minimalistic intake and helps refresh things that you may or may not have remembered from your science classes. Ultimately, it doesn't contribute much in service to the plot though. For me, I really like to see how neurological abnormalities and disorders are portrayed in these forms of media. And with respect to the rise of AI Somnium Files, I feel there are some good representations that I wanna share, but there's also a few that are ultimately just thrown in to sound cool and I feel work against the plot. So I'll start with what I feel is the best portrayal of neuroscience, and that's Mayumi, Ota's mother, with a small cameo from Iris. Mayumi has dementia, and while there are other amazing depictions of dementia in various media, I feel that AI Somnium Files tries to do it more justice. Throughout your interactions with Mayumi, she will always miss small pieces of information, contradict herself, and just plain out forget things. What's worse, she is aware that this happens. This is further exemplified with her somnium as pieces of it are fragmented, broken, or just gone. 
And then you see her dealing with the loss of her memories in her own mind. That raw frustration of having blanks that cannot be filled in. The pain and fear of losing pieces that in time sadly just fade into obscurity. This is something that is real for individuals who are in the early stages of dementia and even through mid. I mean, it's a sad outcome. And honestly, Ota's route will probably end in a more depressing way. But I feel that the game does keep a good nuance of Miami's behavior and portrays it in a somewhat meaningful way in service to the plot. Iris as well with her brain tumor is another nice portrayal. The game is purposely vague on the specifics of location, size, and whatnot. However, it makes specific references to delirium, and this is a real issue with cancerous tumors that metastasize in the central nervous system. This is actually depicted nicely throughout the different routes with Iris's various behaviors. Her perceptual disturbances aside, those with delirium can suffer from impaired sleeping cycles. So that 2 a.m. livestream that she sometimes does could actually be explained by an irregular sleep cycle caused by delirium from that tumor. Not to mention she does suffer from psychomotor issues that the game does mention, for example, her weakened grip, or potentially making more her hyperactive, which is shown in some of her more energetic, almost absurd scenes. So once again, good depiction of two serious neurological issues. Now, let's talk about Mizuki. The portrayal of mutism caused by traumatic experiences seems on point. While my personal focus for my studies wasn't in that area, there are a lot of case studies that document similar situations, and the game seems to make use of them. The issue I like to point out is how they discuss it. So they refer to Mizuki having aphonia, and in the database for the game, they refer to this as a medical condition where a person cannot speak, usually due to stress or trauma. It also makes a clear reference to aphasia, by saying it's different, and that aphasia is the loss of the ability to understand speech entirely. Now, this is one part misunderstanding, and one part completely wrong. Aphonia is when you lose your voice. It's most commonly caused by injury to the vocal cords or other systems required to produce your voice. It is possible that some psychological problems or neurological disorders can make you lose your voice. However, that's a bit more closer to selective mutism where you are perhaps a little bit more conscious in the effort of not wanting to speak. So to exclusively say that aphonia is usually due to stress is kind of disingenuous at the least. Again, as in most cases, it's rooted in physical damage. As for aphasia, this is a disorder that impacts how you communicate and usually occurs after damage to the language centers of the brain. To be diagnosed with aphasia, one or more of four aspects of communication must be significantly impaired post-injury. This is not limited to speech, but also includes listening, reading, writing, and functional communication. Thus, if one part of your speech, for example, your listening, becomes damaged, but you can still speak, you have aphasia. It does not mean that you lose the ability to understand speech entirely. So unfortunately, this is just clearly incorrect on behalf of AI Somnium files, and more than likely should have just been removed to avoid any misunderstandings or misinformation. Moving on, we have Saito next. Saito has a congenital brain defect, which is just a fancy way of saying he was born with a brain abnormality. In this case, his brain is unable to properly secrete oxytocin, colloquially known as the love hormone. This leads him to only getting pleasure from killing things, which, well, there's just a lot to unpack here. <clears throat> oxytocin is a hormone that is used a lot, but it's most commonly linked to two thi main things, empathy in social situations and uh, doing the do. <laughs> in fact, most of what you read about oxytocin is exclusively about the latter. Men and women secrete it during the happy time, and it basically gets all the parts ready, if you catch my drift. It's also critical with childbirth, as it supports the birthing process. Plus, women who have low levels of oxytocin may have difficulty in breastfeeding. With that said, the former is more than likely where we want to be. Oxytocin has been connecting with showing increased generosity and overall performance in social situations. It plays a role in being empathetic or understanding others, however, not so much as being altruistic or self-sacrificing, at least according to some studies. Oxytocin also helps with the bonding process and with fear anxiety regulation. That's not to say eliciting fear, but responding to it. Research has also correlated that those with disorders on the autism spectrum have lower levels of oxytocin, which contribute to some of the individual's difficulty in social situations. 
Another body of research has also looked at oxytocin serial killers and psychopaths. Similar results have been observed with many having lower levels of oxytocin production, hence the potential of antisocial behaviors. So, in a gist, oxytocin is a hormone that basically optimizes social behaviors of humans. So, where does the I only feel happiness from killing come from? This is more than likely set up in reference to that serial killer research, and is likely a sort of misunderstanding. Oxytocin is referred to as the love hormone. Again, doing the do. So it could be that the writers were considering that not having the love hormone would mean that you cannot feel love or emotions, and then the writers use that to build up a psychopathic killer who gets pleasure from murder. Which honestly sounds a bit more like a dopamine regulation issue personally. Not to mention from our interactions with Saito, he's quite social for the most part, so it would be hard to say if he really would act like that if he had low levels of oxytocin, because he'd probably have a little bit more difficulty with navigating social situations. Then again, Saito doesn't really show up all that much, so we don't really see him outside of just talking to Rohan. Now, what gets me with Saito especially are the implications of having a brain abnormality at birth and being the villain of a story such as this. By the time we learn of all of this, Saito was basically built as a complete loss as a human being. Despite the fact that you can still take oxytocin supplements or work on therapy, which is something I will revisit with Date in just a bit. <clears throat> now, I know there's a huge stigma in Japan regarding mental health, even to this day, and this plays right into it with Sosujima's behavior toward his son. But it does seem kind of extreme that nothing more was done by Date and the team when taking Saito's condition into proper consideration. Which brings me to Rohan. Rohan is unique. He's despite Chunsoft trope of a character having a very unique neurological disorder that is explained clearly but isn't utilized in a proper way and arguably makes the whole dang story more confusing if you really think about it. Rohan suffers from hemispatial neglect. When he was young, he received some brain lesions due to external factors that left him with permanent damage. This damage altered his personality and started the hemispatial neglect. The game notes that Rohan was left-handed due to a superior right hemisphere, and that his brain lesions were localized to the left hemisphere, hence the hemispatial neglect impacting his right visual field. This, along with his change of personality and his hemispatial neglect worsening, basically led him down a very gruesome path to almost being completely inhuman and absolutely ruthless. So, for this we need to talk a little bit about hemispatial neglect. This is commonly caused by brain injury to the right parietal lobe, and basically makes it so the entirety of half of your perception just ceases to be. Depending on the damage and the individual, you may not be able to perceive large structures, you may see everything mushed together on one side, or in many famous case studies, which the game references, you'll literally just see half of everything. For example, a full circular plate of food, you'll only eat half of it because you'll only perceive that half. And it just doesn't click that there's a completely other half that you're missing. I mean, honestly, Google hemispatial neglect drawings for some really interesting contents and pictures from people who suffer from this. Anyway, in a gist, the half becomes the whole. So, at least from my research on it, hemispatial neglect isn't really something that worsens. Once it happens, it happens. Now, why doesn't this disorder make sense with Rohan's character? First, let's talk about the neuroscience. Typically, hemispatial neglect occurs on the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere. Left side damages have been observed, but are not nearly as common. What makes this very strange, and why it's not as common on the left side, is that the human brain has regions and sections that are pretty much devoted to certain processes. Spatial recognition has a very, very large presence in the right hemisphere. With that said, though, it is important to note that both hemispheres contribute to their respective spatial fields. So, left side with your left visual field, right side of the brain with your right visual field. However, the right hemisphere actually has redundant systems for visual processing. So, should those regions on the left get damaged, the right basically has a backup system that compensates. This is why lesions in the left hemisphere for sp hemispatial neglect and the right field are fairly rare because the brain literally has a backup. Now, another thing to point out is the location of the damage. Looking at Rohan's character images, we see that there is a large scar to the left of his forehead, roughly around the anterior left side of his head, square near his frontal lobe. Damage here could impact the frontal lobe, which obviously could change one's personality, 
We have the famous case of Phineas Gage, the foreman who took a railroad spike straight through his frontal lobe, demonstrated this. But hemispatial neglect is most commonly found with damage to the parietal lobe, which is more posterior or further back. Now, there are frontal lobe functions that deal with spatial recognition. However, when looking at the occurrence of the disorder, it's largely in alignment with parietal lobe damage. So while it is possible for him to have damage without any visible tissue damage of that area, the game honestly doesn't really set this possibility up. Once again, as I started with this section, the game tends to be very explanative or visual to hit home its points. So just given from the visible scar in Roham, this could be a point against the depiction of hemispatial neglect. Finally, and speaking of depictions, we really have to consider the story itself. Specifically, how much hemispatial neglect and Rohan's personality changes sorry, actually create a lot of issues for the plot. From the get-go, the game makes it clear that he got the Yakuza job after the trauma. This is just this just puts up a whole swell of issues. Now, not to say I have first hand experience with leading gangs or mafias, definitely not. But I would imagine that a mob boss needs to be well informed aware of his assets that generate money, and be able to strategically deal with authorities and rivals. Literally losing one half of your perceived space would do so much more than make it harder to shoot a gun or fight. It would have massive ramifications to language skills, especially considering how Japanese kanji is processed as images. Hemispatial neglect also impacts your memories, making anything you perceived as whole prior to the trauma now effectively halved. I mean, in fact, it actually kind of makes me wonder about the whole skinning from head to toe thing they like to bring up about how cruel he was. I mean, could Rohan actually effectively do this? Or is this kind of like a potential pun that he didn't know where to stop, so he just did the whole thing? I I'm not really too sure. Speaking of that cruel cruelty, frontal low damage is really, really serious. Like, really serious. There's a reason why everyone recommends helmets on bikes and motorcycles. The frontal lobe isn't just about your personality, you know, a lot of executive functions and your judgments occur in this section. So in a very simple way, most of your logic and decision-making is linked to the frontal lobe. So why would the large family that Rohan's gang is connected with want to put him, someone who cannot properly perceive the world, who has clearly impacted behavioral changes, and would more than likely just be losing his ability to make sound logical decisions as the head of a gang? It just seems extremely foolish. Especially considering that, in reality, most Yakuza gangs tend to be centered on business transactions and growing their wealth and power through organizations and businesses, though it's important to note that these aren't always legitimate. This brings us to Date and the ramifications of the sync machine. Now, I'm not going to get into the usual spiel about how retrograde amnesia is portrayed. The TLDR is, once again, its complete trope. Retrograde amnesia does not work that way in real life, so let's just move on to the sync machine. Now, the game actually does explain how the machine works. Essentially, individuals are connected via nanomachines that temporarily enter into the eyeballs, travel down the optic nerve, which bypasses the blood-brain barrier and links directly to the brain, probably around the occipital lobe. Hence, this is why the prototype machine required one of the eyes to be removed because without the nanomachines for that innervation, you needed to have an actual nanotube inserted where the optic nerve would be. So you're basically hardlining directly into someone's brain. It's also established that in the Somnium, someone is basically playing a viewer and someone is playing a kind of generator or a producer. So someone's playing a Somnium and the sinker is basically watching it like an interactive movie or TV show. I think in principle, it's very creative and tries to take advantage of the visual system in order to show, see someone's brain. Quite poetic, I feel. In terms of the science, uh, I think it takes things in consideration and does sound sort of good in some ways. Like, for example, the removal of the eyeball to get the uh, new nanofiber through where the optic nerve would be, I think is, is, is a good consideration. But at the same time, there is a lot of um, skepticism I have about the ethics behind it. Obviously, there's questionable ethics in general, but I mean, to remove someone's eye for the sake of a direct brain connection honestly just seems ridiculously intrusive and it's not really worth it considering that the long-term damage especially if you're considering that like you're going to have a police officer who's going to be eyeless for all of his other work it would just completely lower his efficiency you know 
And then, not to mention on top of that, the game does explain the Somnium as a, kind of a dream, but it also mentions that memories are connected to it. So, even though that we're viewing someone's Somnium, we have the ability to interact with it, which likely means that there would be some changes to the neural network, which would make the memory viewing a bit troublesome. Which brings us to talking about memories. Now, the neuronal pathways that fire when recalling an event are basically different from person to person. So even if we share the same general experience or event, the way we process it is much different. The game sort of makes us think about this towards the end about members being fractal. The proper kind of terminology for that is actually pattern completion. Uh, I actually studied this quite a bit myself, but the long story short is that memories are not one giant ball. There are small sections that are brought together through your neural networks. So to be able to visually map and display that image would be quite hard to do, but it's not really impossible, especially when we talk about support from AI, which this game does. In fact, about six or seven years ago, researchers, I think from the University of Oregon, made a device that was actually able to do this with faces in someone's memory. They were actually able to scan someone's brain and uh, generate visual representations of faces. Now, the results were interesting, not super accurate, uh, but it still set a starting point and a baseline. So perhaps Abyss was able to pull this off with the Wajit system. I'm not gonna go too far into this because I actually think it has some grounded in sort of a futuristic sci-fi way. Now, the game also tries to explain that consciousness is data and that the brain is essentially a hard disk with a limit of one consciousness. It also explains that consciousness can be transferred via the sync machine. So should two individuals be connected for longer than six minutes, they swap bodies, they swap consciousness. Now, the game states with Rohan very clearly that physical brain damage changes sensation, perception, and personality. If a new consciousness were to enter into an individual that suffers from physical brain damage, like one with hemispatial neglect, how would they not have the same affliction? Now remember, at the end, Rohan body swaps of Yagu, Date's original personality. How does Date not have the same issue at that moment? How can he possibly drive himself to Hitomi's or visit Saito alone afterwards? Especially when we see it through his eyes, we have his entire visual field. What's a bit frustrating with this is that it also applies to when Date swaps over to Saito's body, but they address it. The medicine that Aiba Sade refers to at the game is actually something that is there and it helps produce or supp supplements his oxytocin. So it's not a joke. Date is actually on consistent meds, but the game makes very little discussion on it. There's also the memory of the you know, concept of the memory and the neural networks. When you have a conscious swap with someone, does it actually physically change their brain as well? The game tries to address this by saying, I had their memories, but your consciousness is essentially a product of all of that. If your neural network was different, you would be perceiving things differently, just as we see with Rohan. So yeah, it, it just, it creates an interesting, like it should physically change their brain as well. I mean, I suppose so. Dante needs those meds because when he's in Saito's body, he doesn't have the oxytocin. So the science, at, at least at this point, the science gets really wishy-washy, especially with Dante. And it almost has this supernatural feel to it with the consciousness being something that transcends the brain or the physical contributes behind it. And when the game already spends so much time focusing on that aspect that physical things do impact perception and conscious and personality, suddenly at the end with Dante, it's like, oh, you know, bam. It's all explained as like, oh, he just, you know, he had his memories kind of, but then it kind of went away and I was hoping I can get some of this guy's memories, but I couldn't. So how could he still generate his own memories if he doesn't have his own neurons to do it? So in either case, how how does actually the memory swap really work? Does it change the physical brain? It's hard to say. And the game doesn't really come up with a clear explanation of this either. And what bothers me about the supernatural element, at least as I perceive it, is that the game up until the end basically says, don't worry about the supernatural elements. You know, it's just, it, it's all just, you know, delusions, delirium. You know, Iris had her brain tumor, so that's it. There's none of that wishy-washy hocus pocus here. So I don't know, it's a bit hard to say for me. And then finally, um, there's Ayaba, which I'll link in with Date a little bit here. Uh, I love brain machine interfaces. 
Iba's discussion, however, is a little bit more about AI and computer science, which I am very far from versed in. But I can say that it, it would, would be possible for an artificial eyeball that contains an AI that would be linked with Date's brain as something that could be theoretically possible. I mean, it would mean probably likely mean loads of nanomachines or other artificial components being directly connected to Date's brain. So when Iba pops out, obviously there's still some connectivity. Honestly, I'll give it a pass. Um, let's just wait another five to 10 years and see where we're at with our technology. I love visual novels, and I love it when developers and writers work to make interesting interpretations and gameplay mechanics based on the sciences. Stories like Science Gate, Monarch, and 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim all take scientific principles and develop them into interesting concepts that at least open the player to new ideas that they may have never experienced before. AI Somnium Files sets out to do the same with a part of science that is consistently growing and shifting its understandings. Naturally, in a few years of this video, who knows what reality might bring through advancements in medicine technology. I mean, the sync machine may be a real possibility, or the use of nanomachines for visualizing dreams or consciousness for others to see. Brain-machine interfaces could be more commercial or widespread in use. We may all have our own little cute AI waifus. And it's through this, the way that AI Somnium Files opens up the player for these new experiences to get them familiar with the basics of a science that many people even now still view with a certain sense of mysticism and all that makes the experience worth it. It is a game that can inspire and challenge someone to take steps into a new field, to take the time to look up and better understand what is presented before them. For me, it echoes back to when I first played Xenogears when I was a kid and got so inspired to take on psychology and neuroscience as an academic which is why I would suggest checking out this game and taking your time to digest it, understand it, and maybe even learn a new thing or two from it. Then, let's show our love by supporting its sequel, which honestly seems a little bit more unhinged, which is something I'm looking forward to. Anyway, if you made it here, thank you ridiculously from the bottom of my heart for getting through this video. This was arguably an exercise in poor project management as a simple tech review just kind of blew up after 14 pages and around 7,700 words. But honestly, I wanted to give this game a bit more justice than usual. Plus, I really enjoy Spike Chunsoft's take on visual novels. This may not be a 999 or a Danganronpa, but it's definitely worth taking a look at. Well, as usual, feel free to drop your comments below and yeah, let me know if you have, if I actually have missed something. Um, I've been out of the deep end for a while with neuroscience, so perhaps some of you can correct if I missed something. Also, let me know if you played this and share your experiences too. Did you also think that the ending may have been a little bit rushed? Otherwise, if you want to send your love, subscribing to the channel is the best way too. And feel free to share this video if you like. So thank you for your love as always. Anyway, this is show and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.